all of your local and state news in one place. Tune into The District on WHIP, Philly's number one college radio station. Welcome to the fourth episode of The District, all your local and state news all in one place. It is me, Taylor Allen, and my co-host John Cole could not be here today, but now we're going to make do with just me. All right, so jumping right in, we're talking about Philadelphia, the city that we all live at, Temple University, and we're going to talk about Philadelphia's lead poisoning. An investigative piece came out from the Daily News and the Inquirer uh, this week, Monday. Uh, actually, it was Sunday of this weekend, but I didn't get a lot of uh, press and attention until early in the week on Monday. And essentially, it came out that Philadelphia's lead in 2014 was twice the national average, and unfortunately, nothing is really being done to decrease that. Uh, Lead paint is usually in the old houses, and that are typically the culprit. Uh, Last year alone, nearly 2,700 children tested in Philadelphia had harmful levels of lead in their blood. Now, for children, lead poisoning is the absolute worst out of any kind of age group. Lead poisoning can cause irreversible damage, including lower IQ, and cause lifelong learning and behavioral problems. This is what leads to children not being able to perform well in school. Now, this problem, so to speak, is not so much as unknown. Most people knew that Philadelphia has a lead problem. Um, And the city did try to take a stab at the prevention in 2012. Uh, They enacted a law regulating homes built before 1978, uh, saying that any building found with lead should be repainted um, to take the lead out. Uh, Landlords that were renting to families with children eight, six, and under must have had their property certified as lead safe and provide proof to their tenants and to the Department of Public Health. Unfortunately, the problem with this is that landlords largely ignored the law, and city officials said they had no fines collected for such violations. So in essence, it was a law that had no repercussions. There were no fines, there was no jail time. Essentially, there was no incentive for a landlord to pay attention to this law. It was a law with no enforcement. Now, since this whole expose came out from the Daily News and Inquirer, it released an outrage uh, over the city, as it should. So much so, by the next day, uh, Tuesday, in fact, uh, State uh, Senator Vincent Hughes and Art Haywood, whose district cover parts of Philadelphia and Montgomery counties, uh, they were scheduled to hold a news conference about it that Monday, October 31st, Halloween. He said, and quote, hopefully the article is a wake-up call to everybody that this is a very serious issue that needs to be confronted, and it needs to be confronted in an aggressive manner. That was Hughes, who spoke in an interview earlier this week. Uh, these children and these families do not deserve a timid response to this problem. They didn't create it, and they don't deserve it. We need to be aggressive about finding a solution, he said, end quote. Um, The news conference was held Monday. There hasn't really been much discussion of what was disclosed or what was said during that meeting. However, according to that release, Hughes and the other Senate Democrats apparently have already introduced a set of bills about the lead paint that will call for immediate action on them by local, state, and federal officials. The problem I have with this is that it's not as if Philadelphia did not know that there was a lead issue. Clearly, they knew about this because of legislation they tried to pass in 2012. So pretty much what this indicates is that you knew about this problem and you did nothing about it. The only reason that the senator, uh, Vincent Hughes, and even Art Haywood are saying anything about this is because an expose was released. More people became aware of it. They were reminded of this issue. And I, I don't feel comfortable having a release, a press release, stating that the Senate Democrats have introduced a set of bills about lead paint, but unfortunately it wasn't released to the public what those bills entailed. We have no idea if these bills are even real. I'm sure they are because they were reported on, but the public does not know what these bills entail. We have no idea if they're really going to incite any change. I mean, there is a law in 2012, but there was no enforcement. There was no repercussions or consequences for landlords uh, to go again, uh, to abide by this law. So how do we know as the public if the bills that Hughes and Atwood are proposing now, if they're going to make any change? And that's really my most concern about this. Uh, If you continue reading into the expose, it is uh, said multiple times that poorer areas are hit the hardest. And essentially the reason behind this is because a lot of Philadelphia, I mean, it's a historical place, it's very old, one of the country's largest cities, okay? So Philadelphia, because it's one of the oldest cities, has a lot of old homes. And those old homes 
that are not renovated are typically in poor neighborhoods. People used lead paint back in the day in the 1970s and before because they didn't know the repercussions of lead paint. More wealthier parts of Philadelphia have had their homes renovated. They've had their homes repainted because they have the funds to do so. Unfortunately, in poor neighborhoods, probably not their biggest concerns, which it should be. I'm not um, defending these landlords in any shape or form, but it's not surprising to me that poor neighborhoods have more of this lead problem just because most people just need a place to stay and a place that they can afford. And unfortunately, when you are faced with such things, when you just need a place to afford, you're not thinking about safety. You're not thinking about conditions. You just want a roof over your head. So it's not surprising to me in the slightest that the lead paint is more of an issue in poor neighborhoods. And this, the poorer places, is where I previously stated already that five out of six children have high lead levels. That's incredible to me. Five out of six children in the poorest places of Philadelphia have high lead problems. And Philadelphia, it's a huge problem in Philadelphia. I mean, it is twice the national average. Those are staggering numbers, especially for a city such as big as this one. But, I mean, as far as we know, we don't really know anything else as of right now. The release happened Tuesday of this week, and that's when Senator Hughes and Senator Atwood uh, spoke about this and said that they were uh, introducing some bills. I just really hope that Philadelphia never gets to the level of Flint, Michigan, how they have contaminated water and other stuff of that nature. Now, lead and contaminated water are two very different subjects, I understand, but there is some similarities with this. Flint, Michigan, this happened in that area because it is so poor. I argue that this is also happening in Philadelphia because of the poverty rate in the city. Well, I don't think anyone wants contamination of any certain kind, whether that's lead or uh, water contamination. I'm not saying that anyone advocates for that, but I think that no one can dispute that certain things are easier to happen in poor neighborhoods because you can't fund cleaning it up. And I really hope that Philadelphia is not like Flint, Michigan, and something will be done um, in the next few weeks, in the next few months, something to clean up our houses. I don't think that's too much to ask. Uh, moving on into more Philadelphian news. Uh, the septa strike is still ongoing. Uh, I don't know what to say about this one, quite frankly. Septa strike has been on because they cannot reach an agreement between the unions. Pretty much Philadelphia's public transport workers went on strike just past midnight on Monday uh, because of concerns relating to health care, pensions, and breaks. Philadelphia is pretty much, I don't want to say in shambles, but it's taking a hit. I mean, a lot of people do rely on SEPTA for transportation, and they're now relying only on regional rail, car, or Uber and Lyft. And Uber and Lyft actually increased their prices knowing that Philadelphia does not have public transportation at the moment. They said, if you don't already know, as a southeastern Pennsylvania transportation authority, and the strike would affect all subway, buses, and trolley routes in the city. Uh, just to give you some context, about 800,000 people use the city transit system daily. So it is very much a city that relies on their public transportation. This is a problem for pretty much everyone that I know in the city. I know personally for me, I did not bring a car to college, so to get to work, to get anywhere around the city, I relied on the subway. And I'm telling you now, I'm struggling. To get to work, uh, to my internship, 5 o'clock this morning, I had to <laughs> walk an hour so I, was, uh, so I was walking at 5 o'clock in the morning to make it to work at 6. So if that does not tell you um, how much of, A, a commitment I have to work, but just to say, like, the inconvenience that most people have right now who cannot get around unless they walk, unless they get an Uber, then they have, they, there's nothing they can do. I mean, the regional rail is still ongoing. That has not been affected, but regional rail has been packed all week. The issues under negotiation between SEPTA and the Transit Working Union includes pension reform, health care, and wage improvements, which I've already stated before. Uh, the deadlock, however, is about pension payments. Actually, last night, uh, they were reaching an agreement, well, at least getting closer to an agreement, and the main thing that's still a problem is pension payments. The union rejected its first post strike around 5 p.m. Tuesday and continually kept rejecting it until last night, uh, which is Thursday evening. Most people... At least most news outlets are predicting that the strike will end before Election Day. 
which is uh, this upcoming Tuesday. However, most uh, places that you're supposed to vote are supposed to be in walking distance of your house, but that's not for everyone, and they understand that, which is why the city is trying to have some accommodations for people on Election Day if uh, the SEPTA strikes continues into next week. But according to most news outlets, it should not. I just really hope that something happens with this. I really hope that SEPTA <laughs> reaches their deal with the union and that everything will be running smoothly by next week. I mean, my personal opinion, I stand with the people, the SEPTA workers. I mean, they do not have accurate pensions. They don't, and I understand that's why it's a deadlock. Uh, their health care is not the best. I'm not saying it's awful, but it isn't the best. And I'm under the personal belief that everyone should have a livable wage, no matter what your job is. You should be able to live off your income if you are working full-time, i.e. 40 hours a week. That is my personal belief. And I know that for some SEPTA workers, that is not possible under their current wages right now. So for that reason, I stand with SEPTA workers. But I am in no shape or form saying that I am not um, inconvenienced by this. But I guess that's the point of a strike. It's never supposed to be convenient, right? But uh, hopefully this ends next week. So keeping with the, I guess, the trend, you can call it, of Philadelphia and the problems. <laughs> this is turning into a very dark episode. I apologize. Um, I, I keep promising every week that it'll be lighter news, but I haven't been keeping up with that promise. Okay, so moving on to the third topic, still about Philadelphia, still a little bit of somber news. Uh, a report came out that more Philadelphia children are living in poverty. A new report on child wellness by the Public Citizens for Children and Youth was released Monday, found that the number of children living in poverty in the city has grown by 16% since 2008. Now, that beautiful number, 2008, you should know, uh, comes from the Great Recession. That was when Obama first came to office and he inherited the Great Recession and how many people were without jobs, how many people went below the poverty line, that should be noted. And since 2008, stuff has been getting better. But for Philadelphia's children, that, that trend has not reached them. Unfortunately, their poverty has actually further gone down, which is surprising and unfortunate. Uh, the organization that released this report found that the increase continued in 2015 when 38.3% of the city's approximately 342,000 children uh, were living in poverty compared with 17.9% of seniors. So seniors, who I guess we can say like above the age of 60, were living better than the children. Interesting. And then to put even more into the mix, there are racial disparities within the Stark. 58% uh, of low-income families in Philadelphia are black, 22% are white, and 20% are Hispanic, uh, the report has said. So so even among uh, the poorest sections of Philadelphia and the poorest children, there's even a racial disparity within the poorest. And that is notable just because Philadelphia is an extremely diverse city that even within the most diverse cities, there is still racial disparities when it comes to poverty. That is something that should definitely be noted. Uh, they said that the one reason that seniors had rebounded more quickly after the Great Recession was that the government had provided programs and services to help cushion the economic blow, as opposed to children, which most people don't necessarily think of having government incentives to children. It's because I mean, most children are under the care of either their parents, the guardian, or the state. So most people don't really think of setting programs for children, which is maybe something that our government and state localities should probably look into. So the report actually makes several recommendations for improving the chances for city children. Um, this includes raising the minimum wage to boost family incomes, expanding health care coverage to undocumented children, ensuring more children are tested for lead exposure, and pressing to state to adequately fund public schools. Out of everything that is said in here, I think I agree most with the lead exposure and adequately fund public schools. Uh, the lead exposure we already talked about before in the very first topic, but how can children succeed in school if they are affected by lead in their own home, which has been proven to lead to learning disabilities? How can you achieve better in school when you have a learning disability from a contamination in your house? How can you succeed later in life when you already are at a disadvantage. So that I, I agree with wholeheartedly, and I agree with that report. Pressing the state to adequately fund public schools. A quality education costs money. I don't think anyone is going to dispute that, that a quality education requires funding 
it requires good teachers, it requires quality, is money. You need that for children to excel. You cannot expect to give a child nothing and expect them to excel. It doesn't work like that. You have to pay attention to that child. You have to groom them. There is no way that that child can grow and learn and excel by themselves. They need attention, and that attention requires money. It just does. It's been proven time and time again that children with more attention to their different kind of learning abilities perform better. Unfortunately, most of Philadelphia schools and their public schools are underfunded. That is not new news. Philadelphia has had an education problem for decades now. That is why Philadelphia has gone into other sectors such as charter schools. And I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether or not charter schools are good or bad, but just note that charter schools are usually put in place because of a quote-unquote problem with public schools. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate of which is better, public schools or charter schools, but understand that Philadelphia has had an education problem, and because of that, there has been many different attempts to try to curb that and some have been successful some have not but the fact is that no matter what kind of attempt you try to do for these public schools there's nothing you can possibly do if they're not adequately funded now the report also says says about including raising the minimum wage to boost family incomes i mean there's always a debate about whether raising the minimum wage would actually help people uh, Bernie Sanders, months ago when he was still a, uh, a presidential candidate, has always uh, wanted to do a uh, $15 minimum wage. Hillary Clinton has adopted something around $12 minimum wage. And I actually don't know personally what Donald Trump's stance is on minimum wage. I'm not saying that that would not help the incomes of children. I mean, obviously, if the family income increases, obviously the child will too. But I'm a little skeptical. I'm not going to lie. If you raise the minimum income, I feel like all incomes will raise. And then would it really benefit anyone? I just don't see how that would help, personally. But if there was a way for just that minimum wage to raise and no other uh, incomes raised, then yes, that would be beneficial. But if everyone's wage increased, uh, lower class, middle class, and the upper class all at the same rate, I don't see how that would change. The proportion would still remain the same. The income inequality would still remain the same. At least that's my personal take on it. So I would like the report to say something, I guess, a little bit more feasible. So the only thing I would really say that was really feasible on the list of four things, which was including the uh, minimum wage, expanding health care coverage to undocumented children, ensuring that more kids are tested for lead exposure, and pressing the state to adequately fund schools, I would say that the two that seem like the most feasible, at least right now, like within the next year, is to adequately fund public schools and ensuring that more kids are tested for lead exposure. Uh, speaking of education and how to adequately funding schools, Philadelphia Parking Authority, I'm not sure if anyone actually knows this, but in part of Philadelphia Parking Authority taking over, they started out with a promise saying that whatever revenues that the Philadelphia Parking Authority, they would give a lot of it to uh, Philadelphia Public Schools. That was part of the agreement when the Philadelphia Parking Authority came to be. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like all that money is going to the public schools, which is why the state is trying to audit the Philadelphia Parking Authority. So, going along with the story, two of the state's top watchdogs will be digging into the finances of the Philadelphia Parking Authority to determine how millions of dollars were spent. Attorney General Bruce Beamer and Auditor General Eugene D. Pasquale said on Thursday, yesterday, that the joint audit will focus on the Parking Authority's contracts, park races related to the on-street parking program, and whether all the revenue that is supposed to go to the school district is being transferred properly. Uh, D. Pasquale went on to say that, you know, that when it started, the Philadelphia Parking Authority was supposed to give a lot of money to the school district, and unfortunately, some of those funds aren't to be found somehow. Like, and to further this, last year, the authority provided $10.2 million to the Philadelphia School District, which sounds like a lot until you find out that this is actually a decrease from the high of $14 million in 2012, and that is much less than what D. Pasquale claims that the parking authority should have given to the school district, which apparently was supposed to be tens of millions. They said if any improprieties are found, Beamer's office could follow through with a criminal investigation. And 
I think you, so one thing you should know about the Philadelphia Parking Authority is this will be the second audit they've had in a year. The first audit was about sexual assault when, uh, not sexual assault, I apologize. It was about sexual harassment when Vincent J. Fennerty Jr. Uh, submitted his resignation to the Philadelphia Parking Authority 33 years into his career. Like, this guy's been around a while after it was confirmed that he had not one but two sexual harassment complaints from two different women who uh, worked under him during his time there. So this is the second audit that the Philadelphia Parking Authority has had in one year. Okay, and now they have the history or the legacy as of right now as an organization, a parking authority, who has condoned sexual assault, and has more or less stolen money away from uh, the Philadelphia School District. They pretty much stole money from children and sexually harasses women. At least that's their reputation right now. All these things are alleged, nothing is proven as of right now. They are under audit, they're seeing if this can be proved, but that is something notable that in one year, not even one year, within the last three months, they are under two audits. They <laughs> are under incredible scrutiny. And uh, there are rumors that the state might actually take things into their own hands, and the Philadelphia Parking Authority may be no more in the next coming year. But we will have to watch and listen to the story closely. No one actually knows for sure. Speaking of certain things being fraudulent, Pennsylvania State seeks evidence of voter fraud. Uh, the Pennsylvania State Police have raided a Delaware County political field office seeking evidence of a possible voter registration fraud according to court records. In a warrant filed late last week in county court, investigators said they were seeking documents, financial information, and lists of employees at the Norwood Office of Fieldworks LLC, a national organization that often does street work for Democrats' records show. So basically what you need to know about the story is that this organization that is Democratic, they are politically affiliated, there's a warrant that says that they might have been doing fraudulent voter registration or voting multiple times with the same identification. So the state has already raided it. They've gone through all their records. They're trying to find anything that links uh, the two together. So far, they have not, but it is suspicious. It is. In a statement Monday, a spokesperson for Fieldworks National Headquarters in Washington said the company has zero tolerance for fraud. Now, I also want to give you some context. In 2012, Fieldworks voter registration efforts in Ohio sparked some controversy. Uh, Fieldworks employees filed thousands of new voter registration cards in the final week before the registration deadline, and some of them were found to be fraudulent. Now, I'm not saying that the field works in this year, right now, they are doing fraudulent work, but I definitely think it'd be irresponsible for, not, for me to not tell you. It would be irresponsible for me to not inform you that they do have a history of doing fraudulent voter registrations. They do. And unfortunately, I mean, now it's close to home. I mean, they are a Washington-based organization, but this happened in Delaware County. And actually, just last night, another field works. They're the same company, but another location in North Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, no less, right here in Temple's backyard, has also recently been raided under suspicion of voter fraud. So, again, nothing has been proven, but they do have a history of it. It is suspicious. It is something that needs to be thought about, something that needs to be talked about. It is always an issue. That's why certain laws have been put in place. So you can't do that. <laughs> I mean, this is a democracy. You cannot do fraudulent uh, voter registrations and get away with it. And that's why the state police take this extremely seriously, because this is a crazy election. I mean, I don't think anyone will dispute that the election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump has impacted them and taken over their life in recent months. I know I've been looking at it closely every single day. Actually, I'm, I can honestly say I'm probably obsessed. But it's a crazy election, and I don't think there should be any terms of interpretation of, of cheating. I think if either side, the people who are advocating for Donald Trump or people who are advocating for Hillary Clinton, either side, if they even find out or even think that there were any kind of cheating involved, I don't know what happened. I think both sides of the spectrum would go insane if they thought that any kind of altercation or uh, tampering with votes occurred. I mean, people already believe that the election is rigged. I don't think we should add uh, fuel to the fire of that. So I really hope that the investigation into Fieldworks is done. I hope that there is no fraudulent voting. I honestly cannot say that I would be surprised if there is. But for the sake of democracy, I hope that they were not involved with anything like that. That is it, actually, for the district. That's all I have to say for today. And next week, I promise to have some lighter news. I use that promise every week. But next week, I promise to have some lighter news. And next week, we will be back with John Cole.